Hello, Dr. Susan Sherman. I'm the acting director of the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute uh, in Bethesda, Maryland. Welcome to the 2011 ASH annual meeting press conference on sickle cell disease. Uh, this session is entitled Assessing Therapeutic Strategies in Improving Quality of Life for Patients with Sickle Cell Disease. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone to please turn off your or silence your cell phones and pagers. After all of the presentations, we will open the floor for questions and we'll open the, then we'll open the phone lines for qu reporters who have dialed in via the teleconference. To ensure that you have plenty of time for the presentations, we ask you to please hold your questions until all of the panelists have finished presenting and then we'll have the, have the discussion session. Before we get started with the presentations, I'd like to invite you to pick up some material in the back of the room. All of the presentations are here, uh, <clears throat> as well as a copy of a poster, which is right here in the front of the room, about a current U.S. Department of Health and Human Services initiative on sickle cell disease, which Secretary Sebelius announced earlier this year. This goes hand in hand with some of the research advances what we're trying to do is to increase collaboration and coordination among the federal agencies which are dealing with uh, issues related to sickle cell disease, to develop new treatments, to ensure that they get implemented, to share public health data, and to provide some evidence-based guidelines for treatments which will improve the lives of patients with sickle cell disease. And I'm happy to entertain any questions about this program after the formal question and answer. Now on to our discussion of the latest sickle cell research advances to be presented at this year's ASH meeting. We'll begin with Dr. Zora Rogers' presentation of results from a highly anticipated follow-up study to the NHLBI-supported uh, pediatric hydroxyurea phase three clinical trial known as Baby Hug, uh, that suggests the continued use of the therapy is both safe and effective in infants with sickle cell anemia. Details can be found in abstract number seven. Our next panelist is Dr. Patrick McGann, who will discuss data from the baby hug trial that provide further evidence that hydroxyurea has not caused long-term genetic damage in young patients with sickle cell anemia. The study details can be found in abstract number eight. Last, Dr. Joe Howard will discuss research that suggests that patients with sickle cell disease who receive preoperative transfusion before undergoing surgeries, such as abdominal surgery and tonsillectomy, have a reduced risk of, of postoperative complications. This study is outlined in abstract number nine. And now, Dr. Rogers, I invite you to begin. Please remember for all the speakers to speak loudly and clearly into the microphone for those, the benefit of those who are listening in on the phone. Thank you, Dr. Sharon. Good morning. Baby Hug, as you've heard, was a two-year randomized placebo-controlled trial that investigated hydroxyurea in unselected infants with sickle cell disease. It was the result of the work of more than two dozen pediatric hematologists, the research nurses, and data personnel in 14 clinical centers. It's also the culmination of multiple lines of research and really the prescient recommendation of adult hematologists who advised the institute more than a decade ago, that in a disease such as sickle cell where the organ damage is cumulative, the repetitive painful crises start in infancy, that the most logical group in which to investigate the benefits of hydroxyurea was in very young children. Hydroxyurea is a commercially available chemical compound in tablet form, that the, excuse me, in capsule form, that was used in the multicenter trial of hydroxyurea in adults and showed that it could ameliorate severe painful crises and other complications of the disease. Similar benefits, with no additional toxicities, were shown in an NHLBI-supported study, Hug Kids, down to five years of age. In the late 1990s, four pediatric hematologists, two of whom are in this room, had the idea that what else could hydroxyurea accomplish? These four investigators, Win Wong, then at St. Jude, Russell Ware, then at Duke, and here now at, at, um, in Houston, um, Paul Scott from Milwaukee and myself, wondered if hydroxyurea could be given to very young children safely. In an open-label pilot study, Hugh Soft, we proved this to be the case, and the NHLBI, building on that work, 
led a contract that has led to the baby hug trial. The results of the open lab of the results of the baby hug trial were published earlier this year in Lancet. In that open in that trial, which was conducted from October 2003 to September 2009, unselected infants were randomized to receive hydroxyurea or placebo and showed that even at a very young age, hydroxyurea decreased the um, there was significant decreased the amount of clinical events that occurred and showed hematologic benefit. They showed that we showed that there was a significant decrease in painful events, acute chest syndrome, the need for transfusion and hospitalization, toxicities were mild, and limited to a transient decrease in the neutrophil count, which resolved with holding the medication for one to two weeks. The follow-up trial that we're presenting at this meeting took children at the end of the randomized trial and said we have an unbelievably well-characterized clinical cohort. What should we offer these children? This study offered enrollment to the families who completed at least 18 months of treatment on the randomized trial. Because patients were, it was necessary to enroll these patients before they knew their randomized study assignment, Patients were given the option to select hydroxyurea for their child, or their parents were given the choice, regardless of the randomized treatment assignment. 163 of 176 eligible families chose to continue to be followed. They have now contributed nearly 500 patient years of follow-up since the end of randomized treatment assignment. In the follow-up study, we abstracted data every six months from an observational study reporting what medications the cho children's families chose for them to take, what clinical events they had, and what blood counts they reported. <coughs> Excuse me. 82% of the families in the baby hugs randomized trial ultimately chose hydroxyurea when they began the follow-up study. And at each six-month time point, between 65 and 74 percent of those children have remained on hydroxyurea. Hydroxyurea therapy in the follow-up study resulted in persistently higher hemoglobin, mean cell volume, with lower reticulocyte white cell, absolute neutrophil, and platelet counts. Further, compared to participants not taking hydroxyurea, children who do continue to take hydroxyurea have statistically significant lower rates of emergency department visits for painful crisis, episodic transfusion, hospital admission for any cause, and admission for febrile illness. There's also a decrease in admissions for acute chest syndrome and painful crisis. In aggregate, the randomized baby hug study suggests that physicians and parents of children with sickle cell disease should discuss the utilization of hydroxyurea at very young ages. The follow-up data presented today extends this observation and supports this conclusion. So what are our next steps? We have to complete data collection for the follow-up study, and it will terminate at December 31, 2011. We're in final discussions with the Institute for an additional contracted supported period of five years more follow-up. We need to complete the data analysis and to critically examine the growth and development of this population with respect to hydroxyurea use. But on a macroscopic level, there does not appear to have been any differences observed. And we wish to push forward and support, use our data in support of an FDA application, potentially to allow an indication for the use of hydroxyurea in very young children. We're also hoping that there will be some interest in the use of this medication in a liquid format because it's very hard to get a one-year-old to take a capsule. And lastly, the baby hug investigators believe that ongoing follow-up of this cohort is essential to continue to, divine, to, to define the potential benefits as the children grow and to observe for late toxicity. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. Dr. McGill. Thank you, good morning. 
A lot of this will flow with what Dr. Rogers said as we'll be discussing the same study. Um, experience with hydroxyurea for sickle cell anemia is now approaching 30 years and is well described to have great proven benefits uh, clinically in the laboratory and um, recent data suggesting that it may even improve mortality. Um, in, there is some concern given its mechanism of action, however, and its historical use as a chemotherapeutic agent that it may produce uh, genetic damage in these patients. This question is particularly important for very young children in the baby hug age group, which was uh, in the one to two year, uh, nine to 18 month range when they started therapy. And this age group is where the increased incidence of leukemia is for children um, and the risk of malign the presumed risk of malignancy with hydroxyurea is thought to be highest for leukemia. So this question is um, critically important. Uh, so baby hug, as you heard, was a, a large randomized double blind placebo controlled trial uh, testing hydroxyurea, the primary question was to determine if it would decrease the risk of chronic organ damage. One of the primary measures that we looked at was to determine if it uh, increased the risk of genetic or increased the amount of genetic damage. Uh, unfortunately, there's no uh, blood test that can tell if you'll develop leukemia in your lifetime. Uh, however, we used an aggregate of three proven laboratory measures uh, that we measured before study treatment and at the end of study treatment in both hydroxyurea treated patients and placebo treated patients. Um, of two of the measures demonstrated a slight increase in, uh, in genetic damage in the hydroxyurea group, which taken in isolation would um, cause some concern. However, thankful for the placebo control, those results were the same in the placebo group. And when we compared uh, genetic damage at the end of treatment from the hydroxyurea group to the genetic damage at the end of treatment for the placebo group, there were no differences. There was no indications that there was increased genetic damage in the hydroxyurea treated group compared to the placebo arm. Um, critical follow-up, this is a two-year study, and as I said, the, there's no um, magic test to determine the risk of developing leukemia. However, these data provide further evidence to a growing, uh, to a growing body of evidence that the risk of genotoxicity uh, for hydroxyurea for sickle cell anemia is low. Um, as Dr. Rogers pointed out, the follow-up particularly of this baby hug cohort who is a captured audience of young infants who started at a very young age uh, and can be followed uh, hopefully for a long time because these measures that we used and even as technology improves, there are other measures that um, may be better measures than the ones we used in this study. Um, it'll be important to follow these patients uh, and we are performing similar tests on these babies that are followed. So um, this doesn't um, say for sure that hydroxyurea does not cause genetic damage, but it provides further support um, and encouragement that the safety of hydroxyurea in terms of long-term uh, problems is, the safety is high. Thank you, Dr. McGeehan. Dr. Howard. Thank you. I'm going to present the data from the transfusion alternatives preoperatively in sickle cell disease, the TAPS trial. And the aim of this trial was to find out if we needed to give patients with sickle cell disease blood transfusions before surgery. Prior to the trial, it was clear that patients with sickle cell disease having surgery were more likely to have significant um, complications, but it wasn't clear whether transfusion decreased these or not and in which situations they should be used. A survey in the UK in 2005 showed there was a wide variation in practice and in fact a decreasing use of blood transfusion in part because of the concerns about the risks of um, transfusion. Therefore, this trial, which was sponsored and funded by the NHS Blood and Transplant um, in the, the, um, the UK, was set up to find out whether preoperative transfusion increased or decreased the risk of significant complications. It was carried out in 22 centres across the UK, Ireland, um, Netherlands and Canada and looked at patients with SS or S beta naught thal thalassemia, the most severe forms of sickle cell disease. It looked at patients over a year of age who were having routine um, low or medium risk surgery and randomised them to receive a transfusion or not. The primary outcome of the trial was the number of patients having significant complications from randomization to 30 days post-surgery. And we also looked at evidence on the, the amount of blood received, the numbers of days in hospital, and the, the readmission rates. The, um, the trial was opened in, in November 2007, but was closed in March 2011 because of an increase of serious adverse events in the um, untransfused arm. Serious adverse events are complications which are life-threatening or result in death or disability. 
There were 343 patients screened and 70 patients were randomized into the trial, half into arm A who did not receive a transfusion and half into arm B who did receive a transfusion. On final analysis, um, analysis of the results, there was a doubling of significant complications in the untransfused arm, with 39% of patients in arm A, the untransfused arm, having complications, but only 15% in arm B, the transfused arm. In addition, there were 10 times more serious adverse events in the untransfused arm, with 30% um, of patients having a serious complication in arm A, but only 3% in arm B, the transfused arm. The majority of patients had an acute chest syndrome, which is um, a serious and life-threatening um, complication of sickle cell disease. And 10 of the patients who had an acute chest syndrome had to have, um, eight of them had to have a, a transfusion, but all of them made a full recovery. In addition, we found that only one patient had a transfusion complication, um, and 40% of patients who were not transfused before surgery ended up having a transfusion in the intra- or post-operative period. Therefore, the trial shows that, that there was a significant increase in significant complications in patients who were not transfused before surgery. Although the trial is limited by its early closure and the small, small numbers of patients, it does show that patients with um, homozygous sickle cell disease should be given a, a blood transfusion before surgery. In addition, it suggests that we should con consider giving a blood transfusion to patients with other types of sickle cell disease and also having other types of surgery.